Welcome to the All-Star Summit. My name is Kaidi Tamali, host and from BBC The Apprentice 2018. Today we have a very special guest by the name of Lewis Ellis. Now Lewis is on the show BBC The Apprentice 2019, so the year after me, series 15, where he won four tasks, unfortunately lost six tasks, but he still made it to the final five, coming fourth place overall. So please give a virtual round of applause to Lewis. Hi. How's cool, Lewis, how you doing, mate? Good. I'm intrigued now what this surprise is. Oh, okay then. Yes. So this surprise, I've been doing it to everyone. I think, it, I think this surprise is more fun for me, but here we go. You kind of think Lewis is smart. I can tell Lewis does marketing, by the way, because as soon as he saw the green, he knew, he kind of knew what was going. But you ready, yeah? <laughs> I'm going to see it change now. You ready, yeah? You look really proud of whatever you're going to do. No, no, you're not, you're not, <laughs> he's not even done anything. The whole setup, I'm so excited. Are you ready? Yeah. Ta-da! Oh, it's <laughs> horrific. The good thing is, right where you're sat is right in the middle of my face. Yeah, I know. So, so because of that, I've got a choice. I can either do this one for you, Lewis. I can do this one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if, if you want to piss off Lord Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> or we can do your whole gang. Yeah, I'm the gang. Or we can just do my usual London one. What do you want a gang, yeah? I don't know. London looks good. But nah, yeah, no, leave London. Leave London because it looks good. It looks good. It makes you look really good. Okay, there's cool. too much colour going on behind you. Cool, cool. Uh, there you see, Lewis, that's how I know Lewis is a marketing guy, you know. But anyway, so here we go in London. So yeah, cool, Lewis, how are you doing anyway, man? I've seen you had an eventful day, right? Yeah, well, literally. So I don't know if anyone knows. So Coyote, we were supposed to do this earlier on, but I ended up having to rush out for a client um, meeting. So I was like, oh, can we just push it back to four o'clock? And I was just doing some work. I'm on my way home, um, rushing to get back for this Zoom uh, podcast. And then, um, yeah, there's a car on its side, right? And this car is just stopping, so it must have just happened. So I'm like, shit, got to help out. So park the car, jump out. And then, like, there's a guy hanging out the roof of this car. Ooh. And then there's, like, other guys stood around. Everyone's just sort of stood there watching. I'm like, all right, what's going on? Um, and the guy just went, oh, they've just had a crash. Like, and I think these two are pissed up. Um, I don't know what's going on. I went, has no one rang the police? And everyone's just like, no. And I was like, all right, let's bring the what, police guys. What area was you in? To Manchester. This is like a daily thing. No, it's not even that. It's so weird. So literally, I go, right, let's ring the police, guys. So I'm ringing the police. And then two guys I'm noticing are leaving the scene. So they're obviously the ones that have just crashed the car. No shit. I'm on the phone to the police explaining what's happened. Give me a description of the guys, yeah. And the guy comes back to nick the radio. So he's nicking the radio whilst I'm on the phone to the police. And they're already on the way. So I'd taken a picture of that guy. And then I was like, all right, cool. So he goes back off. He runs off with the radio. And... Um, and then the police arrived, and I was like, I, I like sort of took control of the scene. I was like, there you go, officer, that's a picture of the guy. They just went that way. This description, go. <laughs> I'll watch the car. You go and get the guys. And the other cars arrived. I was like, right, this is what happened. He saw the crash. This guy didn't see the crash, but he was helping the, the guys escape the vehicle. Uh, was like, so basically, he's a criminal as well. He didn't even realize. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I love about Lewis, the fact that you just went over there and took control. Like, it reminded me, cause, I mean, even on your first talk of The Apprentice, you were PM, right? That like, you just took control yeah, yeah, yeah. from the jump. So again, it's just you taking control. It was, I don't know if it, I, just, I think it wasn't that, it wasn't that I wanted to take control. It was just that nobody else had done it. Everyone was just sort of stood around. But I, I don't know, I like sort of situations like where you've got to think fast. Yeah, um, yeah. And obviously I don't like situations where someone's crashed. No one was injured or anything. It was just two pissed up guys. But I was like, I've just started vlogging day-to-day -day stuff as well. So I was like, mm. this is perfect for the vlog. I was like, look at this shit. Good content. Um, sweet. Yeah, so well, yeah, so Sweet. So let's get into it, man. So Lewis has an eventful day, but here we are. We're here. I'm so excited to speak with Lewis. I mean, this is... You're probably, yeah, I mean, I've never spoke to Lewis before. We communicate a lot on social media, but it's actually the yeah. first conversation I've actually had with Lewis. So this is going to be interesting. So before we kick in, Lewis, we're about the time on the show. Tell us about you before the show, your life growing up, you know, where did you live? What's your school, uni, et cetera? Yeah, man. So, uh, so basically I was born in Rochdale, which is great in Manchester. Um, quite, when I was a kid, not really much money or anything like that. Um, my mum supported me and my brother and my two sisters. Um, you just sort of struggle by, we've never had much. And then we moved as kids over to a place called Haslingdon in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a nicer upbringing, you know? So I went to school there, went to high school there. Um, and it was a real mixed area. It was, uh, you know, there was some people that are really poor and have not much money. And there was some people that are really wealthy in the same area going to the same schools. Mm. Um, and it was a great little area to sort of an environment to grow up in. Um, lots of like, you know, reservoirs, and mountains, and I used to get my bike and ride over the hills and go quarries and that sort of stuff. So probably quite a, uh, a privileged environment to be in as a kid. Um, I used to play out all the time and that sort of stuff. Never really stayed in much. Um, that was mm. my kind of grow up. Um, I ended up going to college and failing and then and, and failing three times at colleges. We get kicked out three times before I decided to give that a rest. And then I went off abroad me. So yeah, a bit of a weird, 
weird upbringing. <laughs> well, I was always good in school. Like, I was always good at getting the grades, but I was never really mm. the sort of person that I'd listen or take, take advice off uh, teachers and stuff. So I used to fall out with them quite a lot. So then where, so after you felt college, what, three times, where did you go? Was that when you did your season abroad? I know that you went yeah, abroad, so that was right? it. The reason I mentioned that is because people ask me, well, why, why did you go work abroad? It's because it was either that or I was going in the army. There was no other, there was no one else wanted me. Um, and I sort of, I thought that the place where people go where they don't feel like they feel like a part of anything is they go work in seasons, right? So you feel like a bit of an outcast mm. in society. You go work a season, you find loads of weird people just like you and you fit in. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. I did. I met loads of crazy people, loads of reps and, and workers. And where where did you did your season? Where yeah. was that? The very first one, very first one was, uh, I was actually in Bulgaria of all places. Um, I worked with Thomas Cook and then from midway through the season, I actually got sacked, which is great. Uh, and then Do I ended up going to tell why, or is that is that probably no? I was just I was just late. I late. I slept in. Do you know what it was? Because I was 18 years old, and that was for the first time ever. I was allowed to drink every single day. I was allowed to party every single night, mm. um, and there was just no rules. So I was just running myself ragged, and I, I couldn't I couldn't wake up in the morning for work, and I stay out all night partying. So yeah, I ended up going working in Falaraki after that. Falaraki, where's day. that? Falaraki. So that's in Rhodes. That used to be like the party place. Uh, it's definitely not like that anymore. Okay, cool, man. So then what? So then is it after you came back from your season? Is that when you went to uni then, was it? Well, actually, I, I was working abroad for a few years in a row. Summers, winters, summers, winters. Mm. Um, and it was only when I'd got sort of meetings. So basically, I met some really successful people. It was a mixture of two things, yeah? In the winter season, I'd, I was around really rich people in ski resorts. Now, obviously, mm. as a kid, I've never seen these rich people. I didn't know that you could buy a Rolex. I didn't know that was a thing. You know, I didn't mm. know that Swiss resorts had these amazing hotels and spas. But all of a sudden, I was around these really wealthy people. So I was asking them questions, mm. and they all turned out to be business owners, entrepreneurs, financiers, all that sort of stuff. So I was, I was learning about what made people successful in the ski resorts. And then I came away from that, and I did a summer season. And some guy basically said I was too stupid to go to university. So a mixture of uh, fuck you to the guy who said I can't go uni and and I kind of like an aspiring to be like the people I've met in the winter uh, came together and I ended up mm. working. I ended up going, right, I'm going to go to university now. That's interesting. So how did you get into uni then, considering that you didn't, was it A-levels or B to that you failed? How did you manage to get in? Yeah, so I did. So I tried A-levels first twice and I failed but twice. I, I did a B-tech. So I ended, up, I ended up doing one year of a B-tech. So I, I think I had a diploma, a certificate, B, something like that. You get like one year's sort of qualification. <laughs> so I had that. I had some AS levels, more or less all like fails, a couple of like low grade, like D's and E's. So I had some things. Um, and then I used those combined with uh, a, a foundation degree. So I did a foundation degree in business. Okay. And so that's why you did. They all came together. So what was your uni? What did you study? Yeah, man. Um, so I ended up going and doing a foundation degree, uh, which was kind of done through a college first. It was Bolton University and, and Bury College to get that uh, yeah, grade to yeah, go yeah. to uni. When I got that, then I went to Chester, Chester because it was close. I actually planned on going to um, the Warrington campus, which is where I was studying. So I studied there. Um, I did my full bachelor's. I've actually been to the Warrington campus. I've actually stayed yeah. out there for a couple of weeks. I like it there, you know, actually. You stayed there? Yeah, for we had, I was doing some work with young people in the summer, I think maybe, well, many summers ago now. Like and camp. yeah, we did, we had, a, like, they rented it out for us to use. So that makes sense, because they had a lot of police training courses there and a lot of uh, rugby stuff. So Yeah, like, Warrington like Wolves, yeah, I've got a friend called yeah. Matt Heaton. Shouts out to Matt Heaton, man. He used to coach for Warrington Wolves. So, um, and then, yeah, so then what did you study? Is it, you did the um, yeah. marketing, right? Yes, I did, a, I did a foundation degree in business, then I did a bachelor's degree in business, um, and then I did, um, and then I went to a master's degree. I stayed at University of Chester, but I went to the main campus for the master's, and I did business. No, sorry, I did marketing in the master's. So I think that's so. I think that's quite sick. The fact that you failed your college, but you still managed to do a master's. I mean, I haven't even got a master's degree. I dropped out of my master's before it even started. But you literally went from failing college to master's level. I mean, that's literally crazy. Yeah. Do you know what though? It wasn't because I feel like you needed it. You don't need qualification. You don't need a degree, right? But it's because someone told me I couldn't do it. Mm. So it was like, fuck you. Watch me kind of. My mummy had a heart attack, you know. She, she see me fa fail college three times, go work abroad and get pissed every summer, winter and then go ring her up one day and go, by the way, I'm coming back and I'm going to go to university. So mm. she was sobbing her eyes out when I got my master's. Like the bachelor's had her, but the master's, she was like. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Yeah. So what do you just, think about today? I mean, I'm sure you, I know you've got a lot of young followers as well. I mean, what do you think about going to uni in today's day and age. I mean, I appreciate you went to uni when you did. What do you think about going to uni today in today's day and age for students? So I would have graduated in like, what, 20, 2015, 16. So like six, seven years, five, six years ago at my master's. Um, and to be honest, the reason I went to uni four years before that was because, you know, 
I was seeing how difficult it was to get a job, right? And what was mm. happening was I was going for an interview, yeah? And something I was interested in and they would always compare me. They go, well, we've already got someone who's got the same experience as you, but they've got qualifications. So why should we choose you? And it, that sort of wound me up as well. That sort of being dismissed mm. before even being considered. And I think for me, it was more about, I knew that I didn't, I don't believe you need uh, university degrees or qualifications to get anywhere in life. I don't think you do, right? But I knew mm. that it does make life harder sometimes when you don't. So I wanted to give myself the best chance. So that's why I did it. Yeah. Now, obviously, when I did my studies, it was uh, three and a half grand a year. Now it's like nine grand a year. Do I still mm. rate it for that price? Probably not. I recommend anyone, if they can go and they have the opportunity to go, go. But if they don't and they, you know, and they, they haven't got the finances in place, they can't do it, they, don't worry about it. It's mm. just one of those things. If you can do it, I'd say do it. But if, if you can't do it, don't worry about it. It's not, it's not the be, on, be all and end all. You just got to be aware that you're going to have to compete with people that do have it. And also that mentality as well. In some industries, like for example, you know, in digital marketing, if I've got a degree, in, a master's degree in marketing, no one really cares, yeah? But if I go to a law firm as a client, they, yeah. they have high value on education, right? So they, if I say, oh, you know, I've got eight years working in marketing, but I've got a degree in business and a master's in marketing, they will see that as a credibility thing. So it depends mm. who you're working for as well. Do you know what I mean? It's and their mindset. It's interesting for me hearing other people from the apprentice, their, peri- um, their, their experience at uni, what they think of it as well. But after mm. you graduated then, what was your life like before the show, before you actually applied work? Did you started work full time? Yeah, well, look, I've been I've been working um, in marketing for ages now. Um, I did the whole route where you know I came out of uni. Actually, I didn't get you know you came out of uni with a master's degree, and I started to start at the bottom. So by the way, that doesn't help you get ahead in life. I mm. still started. I took a, I think I was on twenty one grand working as a, a nightclub manager when I finished uni because I was working nights, obviously, and studying the day. Um, and I was Which just club being was able it? To pay the bills. Which club and where oh. was it? So they were called Barba. Um, Barba, no, because I used to run an events business. You see, so yeah. well, which one was it? Manchester. Yes, yeah, so I worked between on all Dean's three Gate. Don't on Dean's Gate. Yeah, Gate one and then Sackville. And I've there. never seen. I didn't. When was my last event at Bar's Bar and Dean's Gate? I think the last time I had an event there, maybe twenty sixteen. Bar Bar. Yeah, that been, yeah, been about the year that I left. To be fair. Um, oh really? I, I used to just dance between you, the three. Yeah, just. Well, well the point. You, then. The, the thing is, like, so I was working, um, and I was just paying the basically. Obviously, when you do a master's, you don't get finance, so you have to pay for it as you do it. So I was studying. Mm-hmm all day and then working all night commuting to chester so basically my, my my wage was covering my petrol my insurance and my course fees every month just so mm. i was making no money and i was skint um and then when i finished the master's i was like right time to get a job now make some money i couldn't get a job still even though i had these qualifications because i was trying to go into a marketing i never had much experience in marketing before that and mm. um, so i had to take a, 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 a starter salary at 16 grand um, just basically what you'd pay someone who has no qualifications. And I'd, I was willing to do that because I knew wholeheartedly that's where I was going. So there, the actual degree didn't even help me get the first job. Mm. Um, it actually helps me more today than it does back when I first started, which is really weird. And what made you want to apply for the show then? Is, it what, is this what made you want to apply or what did you actually want to apply for The Apprentice? Well, so I, like I was saying, so I've been working in marketing for a while and I'd, uh, I'd started my own agency on the side. I'd been haunting uh, business owners around Manchester, asking them questions for months and years. I even recorded them. If you go on my old YouTube channel, yeah, back in the day, there was videos of me asking agency owners how they started, how they got to where they are. This is like 2015, 16. No one knew who I was. I was just this really annoying guy that used to turn up in the office, <laughs> knock on the door and ask them questions. I used to go to all the digital events around Manchester and I made friends with everyone that had an agency. At one point, I was a night out, yeah? It was me and 30 people. Every single person had a multi-million pound business. Apart from me, I was just a guy who'd finished university and was working as a marketing exec. So I was, I was, I was obsessed with having my own business. That's why I went after them to find out who they were. Anyway, the point being, I started freelancing on the side back then and I'd been doing that for a while. And when the apprentice rolled around, I'd seen it advertised. I would have built myself up in my marketing career to like a management level. I was running, running everything. And I had my freelance business. I went, you know what? I wonder if I could start a marketing agency. So I applied to the apprentice with a marketing agency. And you'll notice that's not what I went on the show with. So would you a fan of this show? Did you watch my year? My year was the year before yeah. you. Did you watch my, and did you watch previous watched, years as well? Would you, have you been a fan of the show? Do you know what? Before last, so I watched all of last year, and before that, um, I probably watched Michaela's year, which was that the year before you? Yeah, it was the year before mine. Yes. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so I'd watched that year as well. Year. Um, before that, I don't remember anyone. Um, so, apart, yeah. So you that watched was a good couple of seasons before yours. Was it what you expected then when you got on yourself? Was it what you expected the task or anything, or what? Did, what's your thoughts on comparing it to my one and then Michaela's one, for example? Yeah, no, to be honest, I, I, I was a bit let down. I felt because I went in there, right? I took it serious as shit. Now, I wish I'd messed around more and had loads more fun because that made better TV. I wasn't looking at it from, I, I, th- I think I forgot, I forgot they were trying to make a TV show, yeah. So I went in there dead serious and I was treating it like work and I was, crack- I was just cracking on, but that's boring to watch, isn't it? 
So I wish I'd just like had a bit more fun with it and not taking it so serious and not being as scared or worried. And if you get fired, so what? But I was taking it like, shit, I want this so bad. So, um, See, yeah, and then... and then the opposite, you know? I feel like I wish I took it more seriously. I feel like I had... I, would, I, feel, like, I feel like I should have had less fun, maybe. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. No, but it's, it, but it's an opportunity, like... I guess I saw it as an opportunity to, to grow the business, but I really forget that it's an opportunity to also just show people who you are and just open yeah. the door to your world. And I don't know, I, I think I struggled a little bit with doing that. Um, and then apart from that, you know, it was a bit, it's a bit more boring than you expect, isn't it? At one point it was just that like I'm the only guy in the house on the top floor living on my own. And like yeah. no one else in the house and the next floor down is next, next people. So it's just me on my own all day. Just like, this is weird. Yeah. But, um, but, but tell me though, Lee, what was South Africa like? Going to South Africa with your first... So we went to Malta and I thought Malta was it. But when I saw that you guys went to South Africa, I was like, I applied on the wrong year, man. I applied for the wrong year. Yeah, you Malta. guarantee the next one's going to be like Vegas or something as well. Yeah, it, thousand it, it, percent. But so, um, yeah, no, I saw the Malta one. And obviously I knew that the first one, they try and go big. And I was like, oh, I hope we get somewhere like Malta. I hope we get somewhere like, you know, hot. And then he said South Africa, and I swear I didn't register for a minute. Do you know what I remember? I remember the first day walking in that room, yeah, and seeing Lord Sugar with Karen and Claude. And, like, I felt like I was watching TV. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah. I was watching it, and I was just like, this is so weird. It's, in my surreal, head, I was just thinking, it's a surreal moment. It's so very surreal. weird. And so I was doing that. I was daydreaming about how it, I felt like I was watching TV. And then, and then the, I heard blah, 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 South Africa. And I was like, and everyone just went, oh. and I went, oh, no, we, no, we're not. And then, like, we come up. It's like, yeah, when they send you all South Africa, and I was like, fuck, what? I was like, because I just knew it was far away. I was like, I, should, yeah. I can't be right. Came out of the office, and I was a bit like shell shocked. Everyone's like, oh my God, we're going to South Africa. Um, like, when are we going? They went, right, you need to get your bags packed now. We're leaving in half an hour. I was like, mm. what? I've just arrived in London today, and you're sending me to South <laughs> Africa. I've just packed my bag for three months. Have you know how hard it's to unpack a bag after you packed it? Yeah. It's like, well, we've got to take them in. They went, you just need to get whatever you can, take this, 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 and this. And I was like, oh my God. So then, literally, before you can even think, you're in the cars and you were. He throw. It was the weird, just a weird day. Yeah. Imagine not knowing you're going to fly. Like, was it 14 hours? Like, it's just ridiculous. Was it? Was it a direct flight as well? Did you guys just literally just? Yeah, it might have been 12 hours actually. I can't remember, but it was just yeah, straight there. It was just mental. Um, Crazy, the longest man. flight I've ever been on as well. Like, just happened to be where I was on TV. Never been yeah. that far away. Well, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm jealous for you, lot, but happy for you at the same time, man. But in terms of moving forward throughout the series, then what was your favorite kind of task, and what was your kind of like not favorite task? What did you like and dislike about the task? Do you know what? I kind of liked every task in terms of like when you, you're going to find out what it is and you don't know what it's going to be and you're trying to work out who's going to do what. I liked the not knowing. And my favorite tasks though were probably, you know, I, like, I enjoyed the Finland one, right? Because we, we got to go abroad. We got to make a campaign. Oh, you went abroad Martin. again, didn't it? Oh my God, as if you went abroad again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to Finland, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so we got to like make, uh, you know, it was, it was all, I, I could see it was all grounded in marketing. Do you know what I started liking was the fact that everything that they asked, right? Every task, when they gave you an idea what it was, it all had a big marketing element. And mm. I was the only one that did marketing in the whole thing, which was a lot mm. of pressure sometimes because, you know, everyone looks at you and they, and they ask you, they ask you what to do and you're like, I don't fucking know. But mm. the, the majority of it is I can go, wow, well, you know, I, I like editing videos. I do edit sound. Um, you know, I've done the campaign like that. So there was always something relative that I knew I, I had a link to. Yeah. Um, so I always found my place, but the, that was my favorite because that was all grounded in marketing. That yeah, was you like did an really well in that Finland task. So I remember you did really well directing that. Yeah, apart from that, the other one. That, oh no, even it was the same one because then we got to go to the offices in London and pitch at the Lonely Planet office. Right, Lonely Planet is sick. So I'm there in this massive, like, huge building, and I'm like looking at the bosses of Lonely Planet and like where do you guys hang out. Mm. They got like a rooftop terrace over the Thames. It was just, it was just nice, and that whole experience for that one. And yeah, that was my favorite probably. And just while we're on Finland toss, I need to ask you oh, this. Shock. I need to ask you, yeah. How did you pull it? Like, honestly, how did you pull it off, man? Like, I don't know what you're talking about, Coyote. I have no idea what you're referencing. Oh. However, if you're talking about the, the campaign we put together, I mean, I just, I'm just i a marketing guy, isn't it? So, Oh, oh, oh that's how you pull off the campaign. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. But <laughs> maybe when we come off this, you need to tell me how you manage, because I know how under surveillance you are. <laughs> at all times so how you managed to pull it off is beyond me but anyway in terms of what was it like when you lost the first task as the pm then and you, you know you had that epic rant and then you okay. know lord sugar i mean that's one i mean freaking hell that's when we got to know you literally from day one 
I forgot about that, you know? Um, yeah, man. So everyone knows you have to be stupid to be a PM on the first task. In fact, when they go, right, who's going to be a PM? You see everyone going, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I was just like, well, I guess I'll do it then. So it's just, again, the same thing as what I always do, right? I just went, go on then. Like no one else is going to put themselves forward. Let's do this. Uh, and I thought it was a bit of a travel link, right? So I want to start a travel company. My bills, I've got, I've worked in travel for years. Little did I know how different it would actually be compared to what I could do, what we're allowed to do sort of thing. Um, anyway, so yeah, I threw myself into that. Um, it was going all right, to be fair. Mm. You know, sales were a bit shit. The guy, you, I guess at that point, you sort of work out who's going to be really crap. Um, and unfortunately, I found a lot of them in my team pretty fast. So it was mm. kind of like, crap, we've got to deal with this guy or this person can't do that. Or, and it's just like, it's stressful because everyone's like, yeah, don't worry. Cause we, if we get through, Lewis will get fired sort of thing. And you can yeah. see that's the way of thinking. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was fun. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed that throwing myself into it and no one knew what to do and no one knew who anyone was. It was a lot harder. Definitely. But it, everyone knows if you lose the first task as a PM, you get sacked because why wouldn't you, especially mm-hmm. the travel task where I'm involved in travel. Um, but I think I fought my corner really well. What I don't like is when people try to act like little alpha males, right? So I'm in a, I'm in a room. If, if you're a beta, be a beta. Do you know what I mean? So I'm in a room. I'm in a room with some guys that are trying to shout me down you because like, they're trying to prove me. Yeah, I don't know if you've been like. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I forgot the cameras are on me, right? If I was in an office, they would have had the exact same bollocking. It's like, do not think you can get away with that sort of thing. But they thought they could get away with it. It's like when the teacher's there and the good little two snitches are trying to grass you up. Mm. So that's how I, I just sort of lost my shit for a second and just caught, sort of put them back in the place and being like, don't, don't do that sort of thing. Um, mm. And I forgot, so I must have shouted. But you know what? I don't regret it because like, I don't know. It's not about, I wasn't trying to prove anything. I just, I just, don't, I just don't get spoken to like, a, like that. Mm. If you do, you're going to get shouted at from me. And I think a lot of people are like that as well. They don't take shit. And I think it's quite an important trait as well. Maybe I shouldn't have shouted at them though. Um, yeah, that's just how I dealt <laughs> with it. Do you, do you have any regrets? And I know you said you don't really regret that. Do you have any regrets at all from your time on the show? Or? No, I think I was worried about, I was worried about the, um, the shouting thing at first because people are like, oh, it's candidates outburst. And I was just like, I was worried at first. And I realized that anyone that was moaning about it, people that are doing fuck all with their lives anyway. So mm. get, being nice to everyone doesn't get you anywhere. So I didn't really worry about it after that. I was like, you know what? I took a load of heat off it. And I was like, well, that's probably the worst it can get, right? So yeah. after that, I yeah. felt fine. Um, regret wise, in terms of the task, like, yeah, there's one regret, the Parfum perfume task. oh yes yes God, was, yeah. you can tell that i was just at my end right i was tired i i just well i just i just given up i, I was just like fuck it they can have whatever they've got and then it turned out to be the worst thing i've ever seen um but you have to stand by it as well like you have to yeah. go you know what well i believe in it well, you don't but you do <laughs> so I yeah that's my only regret i know that you got a lot of stick on twitter and stuff about that and i saw you really having to defend your corner how was all of that like mm-hmm. then man yeah i had a drama i had a dramatic time didn't i just yeah, thinking about it like, right? Um, yeah, do you know what that, do you know, that was a bit surprising for me? Cause obviously I've looked up to Lord Sugar for years, right? So I've read his books. I've watched documentaries on him. This is before I was even interested in joining The Apprentice. Watched the shows. I know I knew his life story inside out. So he was sort of a bit of a hero to me. See your hero being a prick on social media is not the best way to, to meet someone, is it? Um, obviously we didn't get to speak too much in the show. So my, my impressions of him were sort of just like let down a little bit. I felt a bit sad. Um, and then I just thought, well, I might as well have some fun with it now. So mm. I just replied like, okay, boomer. And then like, I won the argument immediately, which was fantastic. No, it was funny. It was uh, funny. I, I definitely give you that. That was funny. So, I mean, now that you've been on the show, I mean, of course, when it gets back to normal again, you think you're going to still watch it or not? Do you? Oh, yeah, no, I'll watch it. I'll watch definitely. It. Because now I'm going to see it from a fresh pair of eyes, right? So now, mm. like you did when you saw us, and like, yeah. I'll do when I see the next year's lot. We, we know how it is. And I don't like to ruin it for people when they watch it. So there's not, I, don't, I don't bitch about it or anything. But we know that there's all sorts of unnecessary pressures. And there's different things happening that you wouldn't have been aware of otherwise. Um, and if you watch the TV show, you would never know that. But now mm. you've been in it, you know, you're like, oh, I bet I know what's happened there. Or, okay, okay, this makes sense. Yeah, so yeah. I think I'll watch it with a fresh perspective and I won't be as critical of people because uh, I know that. Yeah, because I heard apparently you were really critical. You had to delete all your tweets, apparently. Apparently, you're really critical to my ear. Apparently. Yeah, I slagged you off. Is it? I was you like, slagged me off. Did you slag me off, Lewis? <laughs> you know what? I can't, I can't remember, probably. I don't know. I don't, know what? I don't think I did. I think I liked you when I watched it. But I, I was just like, I was, I, you know, when you watch it and you just go, wow, as if you can't fucking do something it's so simple. I was mm. like, I need to apply it to this show. I'll show up how it's done. And then when I got through, I was like, quick, delete, 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 delete. Because I knew the papers are going to go through that. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, remember when Lewis said this about this? And I was like, no, I'm not having that come out. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I deleted everything. And so what advice, I know when people do go on a show in the future, what advice would you give to people when coming off the show? 
what would you say to them? I, my advice is uh, grow a thick skin and fast. So mm. you learn pretty quick. So still, like, you read a comment, it's negative, it affects you. And then you realize that that person that wrote it is actually basically worth dog shit to you. So don't get offended by it. But mm. that mentality doesn't happen straight away. So when you, when you see a negative comment, you see a negative post, you go, oh, my God, as if they just said that about me. But you're yeah. forgetting that you don't, you need to take, so when you, when you come off and you, you get, you get used to it and you realize the person that wrote that probably isn't doing anything with their lives or hasn't been anything or hasn't been. I've just, seen you, just, I've seen you talk about that so much from your social media, you know, I see you talk about yeah. it on LinkedIn, Twitter. I mean, I feel like you get, I feel like, I mean, especially on LinkedIn, I feel like sometimes you get unnecessarily hard. Like, I don't know, like, what do you think about that? I mean, what do you mean on, on comments like, and stuff? Yeah. It's just sometimes I'm mean, like, why are they going at you? Sometimes you're like, why are they going at him for? I love it though, because who gives a fuck what they think? Like the people that are negative. Do you know what? Here's something that gets me through. And this is the advice to anyone else that comes on the, off the show is that no one's ever going to criticize you if they're doing better than you. L literally no one will. The only time someone criticizes you is if they're doing worse or they're not doing what they want to do in life. It's just that simple. And you, when, you, when you look at it like that, no matter what anyone says to you, it, like even I have the same mental approach now in bars, I get some guy I up for a fight and it's probably because he's got a little dick. And I realize that now. <laughs> Listen, <man>. um, but <laughs> do you get me though? Like I realize it's not, they're not actually starting on me. They're starting on themselves and they're projecting onto me. Um, mm. whether and here's another, another fun fact as well. Like, I realize that not everyone's going to like you. And if everyone does like yeah. you, you need to sort your, sort your shit out because you're not doing the right thing. Because if everyone's mm. happy with what you're doing, you're not threatening anyone's existence. And really, you should be looking, you should be like running the race and like everyone's going, oh, God damn it, like he's doing something like that. I want to do that. And screw that guy. Why does he think he can do that? Because if you're, if you're doing that, you're making people question their own successes and their own values. Mm. And actually, it means you are doing the right thing. So the one thing's for sure is that when everyone likes you, you should be worried. You should be, for me, I find it's 50 50, right? People will either support me because they're naturally just good people or people will hate me. Either way, yeah. I don't care. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And that's a the great mindset that's... to have, man. I remember there's a quote that says that if you find yourself on the side of the majority, go the other direction or go the other way. Really weird that you said that. I just, I've just made a decision to do something similar to that recently. And I keep saying, I'm like, well, you know, everyone's doing this. So oh, I yeah. don't want to do it anymore. I want to go and do this. Um, yeah. So, yeah it's, just, it's just interesting. So what do you say are some of the other worst parts about coming off the show then? So, I mean, you've got the trolls sometimes, but you said that don't really bother you. What are some of the worst aspects you found coming off the show? Um, to be honest, I find trying to... So, right, uh, when I came off, I was working full-time, right, as well? Um, yeah, I, was, I saw that. I just took a new job as well. So, for, for me, juggling, juggling the whole, like, trying to take advantage of the, the, the moment and, and go into the things you'll never get invited to again and meeting the people you'll never get to speak to again. You know, I was driving to and from London quite a lot. I was headed all over the country or I was missing work or booking days off. It was very difficult because I wasn't working for myself. I had to have a full-time job. So, I found that probably the hardest. You know, I had to, I, I had to lose money to make sure I was enjoying the moment because like Michaela said to me, she went, make sure you just take the experience for what it is. Cause you won't come around again. So I, I tried to do that. I tried to go to all the things that were offered. I tried to go to the, the meals, the dinners and the tea. Yeah. You, you, went to a lot of red, you guys had a lot of red carpet events, man. Every time I've seen you look at a movie premiere here, movie premiere there, like what are some of the other best parts you found in coming off it? Like what, what's some yeah. of your favorite parts? Well, I think that sort of stuff was what I enjoyed. You know, it was really nice to, to just go and just do something different, completely different. I'll get mm. invited, like anything new. I get invited to a pantomime in Manchester. I was there. Like, <laughs> you take I just, I just I, I opened up a crisp packet. I was there. Like, mm. I, think, I think that's what it was. I just enjoyed just, just doing these things and cool things. Um, you know, I didn't, that was great. And then I, I sort of started getting fed up with it. You know, I sort really? of started okay. getting fed up with it. Yeah. So like, I was like, oh, I want to get back to work now and I'm, I'm, you know, I need to make some money and focus and, and then the pandemic hit as well. So it was actually a really good end to it for me because it was like, right, time to focus with work. You know, I've not got an interest in, in, in being a celebrity. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in businesses and starting a business um, using the, the, the exposure from the show, obviously to, to boost that profile as this is what I'm trying to do. And, and just mm. sharing the story with people. Cause right, right now, you know, we're, when next year's lock come out, obviously we'll, we'll go down. People won't remember me as much. And then I want in a few years, in five years, people to be like, oh, look, there's where, that's where Lewis is now. Like, mm. I want them to know this is where I was and this is where I am. So it's nice to have sort of, um, to, to have the experience and be on the show um, and to do all those things. But it's, it's, it'll be much more rewarding to look back in five years and have followed the story since then. Yeah. Because, you know, I feel like this is a moment where everyone knows now and then now they see where I go. So that as well, if you fail now, you look like a proper knobhead in front of everyone. Mm because everyone's seen what you're trying to do. So if you fail, you can't even fail quietly. I can't that's go and start working. That's what I have to say to every people. What I found is that everything is magnified. Your successes yeah. is magnified as well as your failures. Like it's crazy because yeah. you've got more eyeballs. You have more eyeballs.
It's like, it's like, so say, say I start, I go and work at the corner shop. People are going to come and go, are you that guy that failed to start his travel company? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll never get away from that. So I need to, I need to just go in or go bust, right? Yeah. But the good thing is, it's like the biggest motivator, right? Because if you know that no matter what happens, people are going to give you shit for it, whether you win or whether you fail, like who cares? Just go for what you want to do. So, t- um, so tell us about these new ventures. And now we're moving on to what you're kind of doing. So, I mean, you've got, yeah. you've got your hustle, you've got hidden, you've got, F the norm, like tell, yeah, tell us about what you're working. <laughs> yeah, I have been all over this. I tell you what, one thing you cannot say about me, right? You cannot say I do not create content. I create, I've got it coming out yeah, my ears. TikToking, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, tell all us, tell us. Show. <laughs> yeah, so you know what I've done? I've just tried to make a real conscious effort. I'm, I'm a marketer, right? And as a result, if I'm not marketing myself and what I'm doing properly, then who the hell is going to trust me with their marketing? So yeah. that's why I try and use every channel, every platform and every opportunity to push my business out to, to people that might want to work with me. So with hustle marketing, it's very much, that is just me and my personal brand. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I talk about is marketing related. Um, and, and I'll just, you know, work, it's all digital, right? So it's like websites or paid ad campaigns. Or I basically, people ask me to come into their business. We look at what's going on and I go, Okay, that shit, that shit, that shit, that's good. We can fix that. Let's go. And I just literally come in, whirlwind, fix everything, and then m- measure it month, two, three, and just watch their business go up and up and up. That's that's it. And it's just get everything right. And once it's all right, we've got a good traction. We're moving forwards. Let's go. Let's get creative. Let's go and make some noise. Let's go and do some weird shit. Let's go and set fire to an airplane and throw it off a building. Not a real airplane, like a paper airplane. Or let's go and, I don't know, let's go and deliver ourselves in a parcel to someone with a cake let's be naked in the cake you know, just really <laughs> weird stuff the point is like it's about getting creative and just having fun with marketing again so that's what we do we're very disruptive I, that's what say, I, was, I then, was really impressed by your website actually the the hustle market i was really impressed by your website and the fact that you've got so many testimonials on your linkedin as well i think it's just goes to show exactly yeah. that you are do you think what you're doing do you think hustle's weird though the website i made it weird on purpose no, like, I, like I made it, it all I creepy think- no, I like it. I mean, to be fair, obviously, I'm, I was looking into you a bit more before this. I was like, right, oh, really? I generally liked your website. I thought, I thought it was yeah. sick. I thought it was sick. I tried to make it look as different to everyone else, right? My brand is all creepy and like purge mask and smoke. And yeah. if I share, right, you'll notice, some of you see it on LinkedIn, if I share a video of a website before and after, like when the logo comes in, it goes like, hee, hee, hee. And then it, oh, and it's got like this creepy, that, it's got like these creepy nursery rhymes that play in the background just because it's weird. Mm. I want my brand to just be different to everyone else. If you're doing that shit over there, I'm going to go and do this. And as a result, we've won some like serious clients and I'm surviving, man. I paid myself now for four months. I, you know, I've just bought a new MacBook. I got a camera for work. So I'm investing back in the business and mm. I'm proud because four months ago, I had no job and I was yeah, going to I thought that you lost the opportunity yeah. before the COVID kicked in, that you had the chance to be a director at this company and it went that they took it away I from just, you. I just took, yeah. So I turned down other jobs and I took this job with these guys. And then mm. you, I even shared the video of me losing my job on camera. I was like, mm. yeah, ah, oh, shit, I just lost my job. And that, then mm. moments... You don't get them back. You don't get to see them again. But I, because I've been documenting everything, I do see them and, and, I, and they are being captured. And I will look back on that day one day and go, that was the very moment I lost my job and it's on camera. Mm. Like who the hell catches themselves losing a job on camera? Like, but I did it. Yeah. So that's why I'm documenting, documenting, documenting. Gary V says you should do it. You know, I knew you were going to mention Gary V. I knew it was going to come in there at some point because you're sounding so yeah. Gary V. I knew the name was going to come up here. I knew it was going to come no, up. I don't even watch him anymore. Do you know why I don't watch him? Honestly, I stopped watching him because I don't want to start copying him. Mm. But I do know some of the, the books that I've read in the past still play in my, in my thought process. And one of the things that a lot of people do is they say they regret not documenting. So that's what I'm doing, document everything. Yeah. Um, so that's hustle. Um, so that's about hidden, hidden, man. So that's about hidden. Yeah. Hidden's, even, hidden's even weirder. So this is just like <laughs> two, two boys that decided, you know, we're, we're, we're not even posh boys. Like there's no reason for us to decide to create a stylish holiday company. But we're just looking at our guests over the years and watching them and looking at how their buying behaviors are changing. And again, looking at it from a marketing point of view, we're like, this isn't going to last forever. So we were talking about it a few years ago. Uh, and then I said, you know, I've, I rang him up and said, I've, I've started a travel company. Like, this is what I'm doing. You remember all the things we noticed back then? Let's fix it. Let's do it. Oh, was, let's, he, let's part, was, he, was he a rep with you? Was he, was he, did yeah, he in the same hotel. Right. Okay, cool, cool. We both ran different companies, but we became friends. And, and, yeah. and yeah, like, it was just like, we know, we know that doesn't work. We know it's not going to work. I actually forecasted the death of Thomas Cook in my business plan for The Apprentice. And no shit, I went on the show and came out and I was like, oh my God, it's just died. Mm. So like, I saw it coming. Uh, STA Travel, I did not see that one coming. But some of the mm. biggest brands though are not evolving. They're not changing. They're not providing anything for the next generation. And they're definitely not inspirational or aspiring. Like who the hell aspired to go on a Thomas Cook holiday? Like you don't go, <laughs> as a kid, you grew up going, I can't wait till I can afford to go on a Thomas Cook holiday. It doesn't happen. Uh, like, there, is, there is nothing that's really, really exciting like that anymore in travel. And there's definitely nothing for Gen Z. And they're the guys that are coming through the ranks and we'll have the next lot of money. So 
millennials. We don't have anything but Gen Z. There's no focus on them. So is that so anyway, what you, you want to create hidden for, for the Gen Zers, yeah? I want to create hidden for the millennials now, okay. but I want it to be the thing that Gen Zs aspire to be a part of in the future. Yeah. So it's going to be created with them in mind. It's going to be all the most amazing things that they find fascinating and they want to be a part of. They might not be able to afford it now, but when they go into the working lives in the next five, six years, they will be my target market. Yeah. So I'm, I'm creating a company of the future that I see. Um, yeah. And everyone right now in travel, is they, their vision is like, that the foresight is like that. You know, as, as you're talking, I can see that you've been a visionary that you are planning into the future. And then what's the lot? And then last year you got F the norm. I don't want to swear you, man. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to swear, but you got F the norm, right? Are you still? Yeah. Well, sorry. I swear. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. Obviously we know that man. We can hear that. <laughs> Gary um, B and you. Yeah? <laughs> in the, in the F the norm. I actually have, uh, I've just paused that. So I've got quite a few recorded. Obviously I've been doing it from, uh, I did it, did it start during lockdown. It was a bit of like a lockdown. I want to do a podcasting. I want to meet some cool people. Um, I think I've interviewed like 18, 19 people. I was going to go over a hundred, but it uh, just started taking over right when I came out of lockdown and I'm like working myself, getting people on the phone and getting the green screen up and stuff behind me. Like, I don't, I appreciate you putting it up because honestly, mine's there. I can see it. And I don't want to put it up. <laughs> like it's keep so annoying. It up. I, I just keep mine up in my office. I just keep it up. I just keep it up. I don't have an office. I'm sat at the kitchen table. Oh, right. so, yeah. <laughs> so mine has to come up and down, up and down, up and down. So I've done, I've done that about 14 times two. So that's what, 28 times now. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, and I've met some really cool people, but I, I want to move on to something else. So I started vlogging because I thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to capture, capture the start of hidden travel instead of sharing random snippets, I'll share the, just the day, the week by week sort of thing. And it, it might be boring, but it could be interesting. For example, it was boring. And then today I drove past a car crash, jumped out and I'm at the scene of the crime talking about this thing that's just happened. The police are rocking up. That's quite interesting. Like mm. you wouldn't have seen that cause you're in work and I, but I'm not, I work for myself. I drive past a car crash and was involved and sorted the scene out and, that, that vlogging stuff is just interesting. Like yeah. last week it was, I got a hair transplant and it was interesting to, to capture because no one ever sees that shit. Yeah. Um, so these are things that it's more of a video diary for me, but if anyone wants to see what I'm up to, they, they can, can see it there. And it is, it is literally documenting the start of two companies with no money. Awesome. Well, Lewis, this has been a great interview. Is there any final words you want to share with the viewers or listeners? Um, yeah, not really. I would say, I would say let's, let's get excited for next week because we'll be seeing your face on TV again. Thousand percent. There's no way you're not going to be in the best bits. Um, <laughs> I reckon they're going to choose uh, the part where Claude is like lovingly looking at you when you're on the stage. Do you remember? Yeah, he's, yeah. Like, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's just so proud of you. And was it a sales like pitch or something? You were just like raving it away. Was, it, there was a few times. So the one, the one on stage, that was a different one. Claude was there, but the one what people mostly shared on social media was the one while selling the donuts. I started speaking German. I started it. selling them in German. But yeah, that was, that was crazy. And Claude was just like. They call it that like, proud <laughs> moment. Yeah, no, you're going to be in it, I reckon. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know when this podcast comes out, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out in the next few weeks. Yeah. So we'll be seeing your face. I'm hoping we don't see any of me. Uh, and I want to see all the old guys. <laughs> why? Why don't you? Why? Why not see you? Because there's all the bad bits of me, weren't there? There was like me <laughs> shouting in a boardroom, me messing up spelling mistakes, me. Mm. So like, apart from the roller coaster, which is me screaming for like 10 minutes. So, mm. yeah, it'll be cool. interesting to see what comes out. Lewis, well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you for, and we had to adjust the time because of the car crash. But everyone listening and watching, thank you for watching another episode here from the All-Star Summit. Stay tuned to the next one. I've been Coyote. He's been Lewis. Speak to you soon.